welcome everybody. This is kind of a wild crowd here. Thank you all for coming. We, we have a real, it's a real honor to invite, to welcome our guest uh, this evening, Gerald Schlabach. Um, the Benedictine Institute, as you know, um, has as its mission the strengthening of a sense of Benedictine traditions and knowledge about the Benedictine way of living out the Catholic faith uh, among all of our students, faculty, and staff. And I'm delighted that many of you have been a big part of this. Lots of you here have been on the summer, summer trips to in the footsteps of Benedict and to Eichstätt and Metten. Um, and so it's our intention to continue strengthening the Benedictine tradition in our places as lay people have a bigger and bigger place, in, both in monastic life and in the life of the church. Um, Gerald and I have spent time together. Um, Abba John was the one who said, oh, try to get Gerald Schlabach to talk for the Feast of St. Benedict. Um, Gerald, you, you talked about that point in your life where, Benedict, where monasticism became somewhat interesting, and you picked up a book by Kathleen Norris, Cloister Walk. Have people read that book? Some of you have. And in the first page of the book, she talked about becoming a Benedictine oblate, and she wasn't Catholic. And, ben, and Gerald said, I can do that. This is before he uh, became a Catholic, before you became a Catholic yourself. Um, at that point, he was in Ohio, and he affiliated himself with the monastery in Cleveland, St. Andrews. OK. And, um, and then, ultimately, he ended up at St. Thomas and became an oblate with St. John's Abbey. Um, since then, his sense of monastic values has deepened at every step. As part of the Mennonite um, Catholic dialogue that was held here at St. John's, um, he became friends not only with Abbot John, but with a whole group of people interested in the ties between the Mennonite faith and the Catholic uh, way of living out Christianity. So I would like to invite Carla Durand to continue this introduction of Gerald Schlabach, our colleague from St. Thomas. On behalf of the two co-sponsoring organizations of this lecture, the Collegeville Institute for Ecumenical and Cultural Research and the Benedictine Institute, I would like to welcome each of you to this presentation entitled, The Classroom at the End of the World, When Glamour Beckons, Can Benedictine Values Compete? So on this, the eve of the Feast of St. Benedict, which also marks the anniversary of the death day of St. Benedict almost 1,500 years ago. It seems an appropriate time to reflect upon the teachings of St. Benedict and how those teachings and values have relevance in today's world. And our speaker this afternoon, Gerald Schlabach, will help us do just that. As a theologian, a Benedictine oblate, and a man of faith, Gerald knows well the teachings of St. Benedict, and during this lecture today, he will help us better understand how these Benedictine values can compete, or perhaps coexist, with the lure and glamour and celebrity of the time we live in. Gerald has been a Benedictine oblate since the late 1990s and a Roman Catholic since 2004. He is a member of the American Benedictine Academy and is co-founder and director of Bridgefolk, 
a grassroots ecumenical group of Mennonites and Roman Catholics with, which has its North American home right here at St. John's Abbey. He is professor of theology and director of the Justice and Peace Studies program at the University of St. Thomas. Gerald received his BA in History and Communication from Goshen College in Indiana, his MA in Theological Studies from the Associated Mennonite Biblical Seminary in Elkhart, Indiana, and his BA, PhD from the University of Notre Dame. He has a strong record of publications, and his books include Just Policing, Not War, An Alternative Response to World Violence, which was published by Liturgical Press in 2007, and Unlearning Protestantism, Sustaining Christian Community in an Unstable Age. And most recently, he was both contributor and editor for Sharing Peace, Mennonites and Catholics in Conversation, and that too was published by Liturgical Press in 2013. Gerald will be with us on our campus through the rest of this academic year, and so we welcome him this afternoon. Please join me in welcoming Gerald. Of course, I've joked with Carla that she may have to call the uh, sheriff to evict me on May 1, but I... <laughs> It's a great honor to be here, especially on this occasion. Um, St. John's in many ways over the years has become my spiritual home. It would take a different kind of talk to, to explain that, uh, so I'll just leave it at that and uh, say thank you for hosting me in so many ways, hosting Bridge Folk and so on. Before I get into the heart of my presentation, uh, I want to make a few remarks about what I'm going to be up to. What I'm going to do is share an essay. Essay because it was originally written in, composed in that format, but more importantly, an essay in the original French uh, meaning of the word an exploration, an exploratory attempt, maybe slightly meandering, but all the more interesting, at least I hope, uh, because of the journey. I'm not coming to you as an expert with a definitive answer to the question that I'm going to be putting before us, that I kind of have on the screen. Um, and I really mean that. It's not just a rhetorical device, a little self-deprecation at the beginning. Um, Father Terence Cardung, uh, in, as was quoted in some of the uh, advertising for this event, has said very gratifying things about my understanding of Benedictinism, um, even though I'm not a monk, particularly uh, the place of stability. But how to teach, how to get students excited about Benedictine values, about virtues generally that are self-effacing, that don't need to advertise themselves. That for me is a puzzle. So my essay is going to end with, uh, in the only honest way that I know how, by opening it up ending with an open-ended question, hopefully allowing me to learn uh, a little bit from you. My hope is that you will help me out, uh, you who teach and mentor students at these marvelous Benedictine schools. Now, is that what I mean by the classroom at the end of the world? St. John's and St. Ben's, are they at the end of the world? No, Stearns County is not the end of the world. And by the way, I'm not predicting an imminent apocalypse either. Uh, two things are at work here. Rightly or wrongly, monasticism has been associated with fleeing the world. Rightly and wrongly, I think. 
Because part of the task of education and formation in the monastic tradition, I assume, I take it, is to explore why one may paradoxically go deeper into the world, into the life of the world, by doing what appears to be fleeing the world. It occurred to me just a couple days ago, you know, worldliness, we've associated the use of that term with a certain kind of older, pious uh, deprecation of the world, of the things of the world. It occurred to me, you know, uh, Stephen Colbert came up with this term, truthiness. Uh, I think worldliness works in kind of the same way. Worldliness. Uh, Worldliness is to the world as truthiness is to the truth. Kind of a not quite reliable version of the truth. Um, so I'm not talking here about fleeing the world in the sense of uh, not appreciating life in these bodies, in this world, appreciating creation. Anyway, my title seemed appropriate to that as a way to echo the centuries-long discernment in the monastic tradition about how does one go deeper into the life of the world by apparently fleeing the world. In any case, our larger American culture, at least the media, sometimes does portray a place like this as the end of the world, or if not that, then flyover country. As you'll see, that attitude is part of what I want to tackle here. Finally, Benedictine values uh, appears in my title. I think will be everywhere in my essay and yet nowhere. Everywhere, everywhere in the sense of implied, reflected upon, but I'm not going to dwell upon it, uh, mention it, even that phrase. Rather. I'm using uh, this phrase, this question from the baptismal uh, rite, um, also used in the sort of renewal of baptismal vows um, in the Catholic tradition. This phrase, it seems to me, is what lies behind all of the Benedictine values. Benedictine charism, Benedictine vows, Benedictine spirituality, and its witness to the wider church and to the world. It's not a phrase that's specifically Benedictine at all, but does have this other advantage. It's a wider term. It applies to all, at least in the Catholic ritual uh, of baptism, applies to all Christians, speaks to all Christian lives. So as we consider how to transfer, in a place like this, Benedictine values from monks to lay people, educators in Benedictine schools to students, it may provide exactly the link that we need. But meanwhile, in order to make sure you get your money's worth, since this is advertised as you know, something about Benedictine values, uh, I want to do some cross-referencing on the screen um, so that what you hear will match, uh, what you see will allow you to make connections with what you hear. What I'll be doing on the screen here is um, collating, cross-referencing my talk with the 12 Benedictine values as they appear on the website, as they appear on posters around the campus and so on. Um, not in the same order, a couple times repeated, but all 12 of them at least once. So, do you reject the glamour of evil? In the Roman Catholic rite of baptism for adults, and in the church's liturgy of baptismal renewal for all baptized believers, a striking question confronts us. Do you reject the glamour of evil? The question has ancient roots in early baptismal practices. In parallel with the rejection of Satan in these rituals, 
it might be expected to attract attention for what it is, a rare case in which even the most staid and proper of modern Christians participates in what we can only call a kind of exorcism. Or if not that, a rare case in which even comfortable bourgeois Christians are expected to renounce the culture that continues to clothe them even though their original baptism already proclaimed the stripping of old ways. Or if not that, a rare case in which the church takes up the topic of glamour at all. Yet somehow few seem even to have noticed the phrase. A search for the mo uh, through the most exhaustive electronic database of journals dedicated to religion and theology yields scarcely a dozen hits in which the phrase appears. Most references are passing. Nearly all the articles reflect at length on the phrases import, oh, nearly all the articles that do reflect at length on the phrases import come from publications in Africa. These explore how the church on the continent might adapt or expand upon the renunciation section of the rituals of baptism and baptismal renewal in order to enculturate the Roman liturgies more fully in an African context. That context includes lively belief in a very real spirit world. Christian salvation can hardly be complete if it does not liberate new believers from its evil forces. Hence the interest in Africa. I wonder though whether Christians in America, Europe, and the urban metropolises of fast globalizing capitalism do not need liberation from the glamour of evil just as much, if not more. Now don't get me wrong. I do not believe that glamour per se is evil, nor that everything glamorous is evil. Suspect, maybe, but not necessarily, not automatically evil. The problem with glamour is that it is surface. It is the shiny patina, the thin veneer that makes something appear good and beautiful whether or not it actually is. That which truly is good may also shimmer with a glamorous shine. Beauty that is skin deep can also go deeper, continuing down to the marrow. But here's the catch. That which is truly good or, or authentically beautiful does not need the shimmer of glamour in order to attract, but evil does. The deeply and truly good can project its beauty in earthen tones or bold ones. Its surface can be glossy, but can also be matte. Its light may occasionally reach our eyes in the pure color of neon, but more often in the subtleties of chiaroscuro. Or it can continue long without attracting notice at all. For the good is self-confident, it is intrinsic like the grain of solid hardwood and unlike veneer, its pattern runs with infinite variability, yet utter consistency all the way down. It is authentic. And so, quietly, without fanfare, without pretense, the good is capable of drawing us into relationship. If we saw to the heart of evil and falsehood, we would be repulsed. Seeing it for what it is, we would naturally, instinctively move away from it. The desire it evokes, therefore, is in fact an anti-desire, a desire for distance, not union, unless it distracts or deceives. That is why evil needs glamour in a way that the good does not. So often, after all, evil seems so attractive to many. Literature, literature about good people leading virtuous lives is apparently hard to write. Some joke, or perhaps they're serious, that they would prefer to go to hell and hang out with interesting characters from history than to experience the infinite boredom of heaven. If they are reacting to the self-righteousness of those who are smugly and boringly pious, then of course, they are in fact seen through yet another veneer of glamour, religious glamour now worn thin. This is the falsehood of believers who try to project goodness while avoiding the hard interior work 
of allowing God's goodness to purge and forgive them in secret. With Dante and C.S. Lewis, and I presume Jesus, I suspect that the greater population of hell will be boring and petty in just this way. Whether its inhabitants are the many self-righteous or the few horrific criminals, their punishment will, I suspect, be to have their innards reveal as dull to the core due to a lifelong of willful neglect. Of course, I'm drawing a stark contrast here in order to make a point. A properly Christian and orthodox worldview sees evil as a nothing, not a something. This at least is how I have come to understand the Christian view, worldview by thinking with the likes of Augustine and Aquinas. Evil in their account is wholly parasitic on the good. I thus speak starkly of the good and the evil, but do not draw a stark contrast between good people and evil people. There was a journal article I read in um, graduate school when I was studying Augustine called Only Something Good Can Be Evil. Gets at this point. For evil people must still enjoy dignity and goodness in some way in order to exist and function at all. And good people, in order to solidify their virtue, must be ever keen to ferret out their remaining dark corners of self-deception and ever quick to cry out for God's grace. To name these complexities simply fills out further our picture of why evil needs glamour in a way that good does not. Consider the celebrities who catch our eye on magazine covers as we go through checkout lanes in grocery stores. None could rise to such prominence without exercising real God-given talents. Their acting abilities, their athleticism, their musicality, their business acumen, even the marketing finesse that accentuates their glamour in order to catch our eyes. These are goods. And the best of celebrities, not that I know any, but one hears, the best of celebrities are truly generous and caring people. But would we really want to hang out with most of these people on celebrity magazine covers as close friends? Be careful, this is a trick question. Hang out? Probably, because we too would like to bask in their celebrity glamour for a while, perhaps taking in the, the perks of stimulating party life in the mix, then carrying home an autograph or a memento at the end. If that is all we are looking for in relationships, it says more about how we may be caught, getting caught up in the allure of glamour, of glamour ourselves and risking our own superficiality. My question, though, was whether we'd want to spend time with most of these celebrities as close friends. Because that implies something deeper, the reliable intimacy of abiding, trustworthy relationship, the promise that our best secrets will be held with confidence and our worst faults met with compassion. If we actually buy one of these magazines, delve deeper into the pages and reflect on the stories, we may not be so sure. For not always, but too often, what we will find are stories of betrayal, pettiness, infidelity, jealousy, or the substance abuse that reflects a loneliness or insecurity from which fame and wealth were supposed to insulate. Would these really be the intimate friends upon whom we would want to rely? I would never want to deny, therefore, that underneath some glamour lies authentic good. But I do think it is fair to confidently say this. The more a person, or the more a culture, pursues surface beauty, shimmering glamour, or magazine cover prominence as ends in themselves, the less reliable will anyone's hidden qualities be. Would anyone really deny this? Would anyone actually claim that fame and attention has a tendency to make people better, kinder, more compassionate, or deeper human beings? I think not. Ah, but does it make us happier? That, I suspect, is the rub. That is the temptation. That is why so many pursue glamour. Who needs to be a deeper person if fame and wealth and attention are bringing the pleasures we assume will come with them? Who needs to be kind if everyone is fawning on me? 
all things being equal, sure, I guess I'd like to be a better person, but all things are not equal. Becoming better takes work. It might even require suffering. The people you Christians hold up as the best, the saints, sometimes got there through martyrdom. No thanks, we say. One could, of course, pursue a parallel line of inquiry about the difference between superficial pleasures and deep happiness or authentic joy. The confusion between happiness and pleasure surely reinforces our culture's confused infatuation with glamour as the key to happiness. But I actually want to defend pleasure, at least the exquisite, though subtle and subdued pleasures that one can only discover by rejecting the glamour of evil. I'm resisting the rhetoric, rhetorical strategy of social diatribe here. I could expound upon, but will only tag, a few of the many possible examples of our culture's preference for appearance over substance. Increasingly, it seems, advertising has come to evo evoke ephemeral style over the actual qualities of products. Increasingly, it seems, politicians fast-track their candidacies through self-promotion and grandstanding rather than through accomplishments at actually governing. Increasingly, it seems, recreation is indoors, two-dimensional and virtual, in other words, on screens like this, rather than outdoors, three-dimensional, engaged with the real world of woods and neighborhoods. Increasingly, it seems, the tenuous commitment of cohabitation replaces the lifelong covenant of marriage. Increasingly, it seems, hooking up takes the place of courtship. Pornography displaces even that much intimacy. Increasingly, it seems, young people face incessant pressure to succeed socially than professionally by branding themselves as though they too were products. And increasingly, it seems, social critics like me settle for deconstruction and critique rather than constructive proposals or witness to better ways of joyous authenticity, the quiet but self-confident opposite of glamour. Simply to tell a story of cultural decline is itself superficial, after all. And I'm turning the tables on myself here a bit. Nostalgia for a past that may never may or may not have existed, it itself glamorizes the past. If there's something new and different about our current situation, it is not that glamour tempts us, but that new technologies of media and marketing are perfecting our ability to project allure and apply the patina. So I will end my list of cultural choices for glamour over substance there, except for one more bullet point. Increasingly, it seems, or perhaps for decades, the education industrial complex, too, has served to lure. This is the one industry that I can critique with some claim of authenticity. My own industry, the academy, the educational industrial complex. If we are actually to quiet the allure of the glamorous, it can only be by projecting a vision of authentic good and the deeper but subtler pleasures that attend to the truly good life. But just here, as an educator, I'm haunted and somewhat puzzled. How really can this happen in the classroom? First, the haunting. Of all that I've read over the years about the state of higher education in the United States, Nothing has troubled me more than a few sentences in a now 25-year-old essay by Wendell Berry entitled, The Work of Local Culture. The essay appears in a book with the slightly jarring title, What Are People Good For? Anything but technocratic and utilitarian, Berry's implicit answer is that people are supposed to be good for each other. The work of local culture to which he referred is that of storing memories and history and mutual assistance and ongo ongoing patterns of trust, the way soil stores and holds the energy of the past, thus improving the land and making future community sustainable. 
A living local culture needs a vibrant local economy, though, one in which members across generations offer each other an exchange of useful skills. For decades, Barry argued, our educational system has been doing the opposite. Quote, the child is not educated to be of use to the place and community. He or she is educated to leave home and earn money in a provisional future that has nothing to do with place or community. Let me reread that. The child is not educated to be of use to the place and community. He or she is educated to leave home and earn money in a provisional future that has nothing to do with place or community. The good life, in other words, is always someplace else. This is the meta message of American higher education. It is a message of glamour. No more than that, is the, it is the systematization of glamour. If I live in Stearns County, Minnesota, the good life will be in Minneapolis. If I live in Minneapolis, it will be in Denver or Seattle. If I live in Chicago, then New York. And if I begin to tire of the bright lights and dehumanizing pace in one of these places, I might dream of returning to rural life. But it too often will be a glamorized rural life that I'm envisioning. Unless, unless. In any one of these locales, at the turn of hypermodern mobility, joyous authenticity is possible. But it means that the farmer, whether an inheritor of generations or back to the land locavore, must find pleasure not just in cash crop profits or upscale restaurant tastes, but in the work itself, the smell of the land, the sweat, the tiredness. It means that the urbanite must find pleasure not just in theater and the bar scene, but in community organizing and social entrepreneurship and parish life. It means that the community organizer must find pleasure not just in the abstract ideals of social justice, but in meeting again and again with neighbors whose unruly, unruly political ideals are jarring. But damn it, they're my neighbors. It means the social entrepreneur finds pleasure in seeing resources and projects fit together for the good of real people. It means pastors and parishioners seeing Christ in each other, even when they sing off key, or the homily falls a little flat, or the woman in the next row is probably voting wrong. <laughs> and it means taking time. Taking time does more for resisting the glamour of evil than finding just the right place to do so. Instant gratification and quick results are the enemy, not urban locales or rural locales or possibly even suburban ones, though I'm least confident about the moral neutrality of the suburbs. Impatience is the wily demon that tempts us to look for a better life elsewhere before we've invested in our towns and neighborhoods. Impatience is the demon that prods young people to hook up culture rather than courting, or young adults to cohabit rather than marry. Impatience distracts married folks, too, even in healthy marriages, before they can discover the subtly exquisite joys that can only come when spouses see each other through inevitable hard times, trusting that the other meant, meant it when he or she said, till death do us part. Impatience values quick profits over quality, turns financial investment into a game of speculation divorced from actual productivity, or produces real goods but without thought of sustainability or environmental costs. Impatience strip mines. But when we hold the shiny consumer item that those strip mines power far away, then we, too busy or distracted by its shimmer, need not notice. Ah, but I'm doing it again. Critiquing more than envisioning, naming the temptation of fleeting glamorous pleasures rather than portraying the beauty of enduring authentic pleasures. But that's the puzzle that follows from Wendell Berry's haunting warning about how so much of our education system is structured to lure young people away from real places to any place, 
before they have taken time to really know their land, their people, the virtues embedded in their foibles and the stories of tragedy and comedy that explain how virtue and foible can coexist in ordinary ways that are not so boring after all. How do I convey this in the classroom to 19-year-olds itching for adventure or anxious to find a career-building job? How do I convey this amid sterile desks using the PowerPoints I need to glamorize my lesson plans enough to compete for my students' shortened attention spans? How do I convey in an entertaining way, as I'm pressured to do, that the constantly entertained life is a ruse? I've read Parker Palmer's Courage to Teach and its counsel to share one's own life with, uh, with authenticity. I've had modest success with readings that narrate stories of saints and seekers. But my most satisfying classes have been off campus and abroad, where there is proximity and time, there it is again, time. Time for us to be more than professor and student in one another's presence. But that only accentuates the puzzle. I too have needed to go elsewhere to do my best teaching. How then to do just as well in the classroom on campus? The puzzle itself haunts me, for I worry that I have failed most as a teacher of Christian ethics at teaching one of the two or three things I most wish my students to learn. I'm not beating up on myself here, for it really should be no surprise that joyous authenticity, which is the opposite of the glamour of evil, is comfortably indifferent to its entertainment value, or is even self-effacing. So I can reassure myself, that which is self-effacing is the most difficult to teach. But I still want to teach it, to model it, to pass it on. So the puzzle remains. And so I hope to take counsel from all of you. So this is your chance, by the way, to uh, tell off a St. Thomas prof. <laughs> I invite your comments and questions, of course, but I'm most interested, really I'm interested in learning from some of you who are educators in the Benedictine tradition about best practices. If I've made sense, resonated with your own experiences, hopefully you'll have some best practices to report. Just a comment, if you, if you do have a comment or a question, if you would use one of the two microphones on either side, that will help with the uh, digital recording. But let me, before Bill talks, uh, it occurred to me just th this morning, uh, one other thought, to explain what I mean about how values which are self-effacing are the hardest to communicate. Um, it occurred to me, thinking back to these 12 Benedictine values, um, humility isn't on the list. Humility is one of the key teachings in the, in the rule of St. Benedict. It's not on the list of how you advertise yourself. This isn't a criticism, I mean, I'm just saying it's hard. Humility doesn't advertise itself well, you know? <laughs> and yet it's key to all the rest of the Benedictine values, I think, in a sense, but anyway. When Carla introduced you, Gerald, she said that you were not just an estimable scholar, but a man of faith. And that was very evident in this. Uh, thank you very much. It was very instructive. What I'm wondering about is how we live or proclaim or bring those values to uh, a, a crowd that might not appreciate where they have come from. In our attempt to be inclusive and, and democratic, um, we sometimes claim Benedictine values without the recognition that they come from the um, the, the rule of Benedict, which finds its inspiration in the inspired gospel. 
So how do we do that? How do we answer your question without presuming a life of faith? Is it, is it possible to have collaborators and students sharing or proclaiming um, Benedictine values if, um, if they are not uh, taking root in the proclamation of the gospel? That was not a comment, that's a question. Well, I take I it, you solve that for me. I take it, though, as a rhetorical question <laughs> in many ways, although, I, I mean, my, my counter comment would simply be, okay, I've posed this for the classroom because that's my world. Um, clearly, it's going to be the challenge for pastors, the challenge of evangelization, new evangeliz evangelization or old evangelization, any kind of evangelization. I mean, we have a gospel, we have a message as Christians which, you know, the word gospel means good news, but it calls people to take up their cross and die. So, I mean, that's where I think all of our, I mean, with the promise that that's how you gain your life, you know, at the same time. Um, so, yeah, it's, I'm sure it's easy for pastors, preachers, priests like yourself uh, to have your own set of temptations to, you know, provide a feel-good gospel to, you know, leave out the hard parts sometimes. You know, thankfully in the Catholic tradition we have Lent, we're in, you know, so we have some built-in reminders uh, structured into our life together. But it is good news. That's the, th you know, so I think we need, a, you know, uh, Father Michael Driscoll here working on aesthetics and liturgy. You know, we're, we have to pass on the beauty at the same time. Or not pass on, pro project the beauty. Well, the Benedictines don't talk about humility, but they're very proud of it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, how? A joke that's been made in Mennonite circles very often also. <laughs> How important is uh, contact with nature uh, in, in developing a spirituality? In other words, can students at St. Thomas be spiritual? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're right next to the Mississippi River. We can. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, has taught a class on uh, uh, environmental ethics in. Uh, you know, weather permitting, she takes students, you know, it's like two blocks away to go to next to the river and has them, has them sit, just sit, get away, you know, turn off your phone, turn off your smartphone, your devices, just sit for 20 minutes. Um, and that's, that's important. Having said that, you know, I, I'm posing the, the, the title is very deliberate, The Classroom. What I was alluding to when I said my best, my best um, experience as a teacher have been when I've taken students to Guatemala. We have a January term. Um, so we've got three and a half weeks together. It's a different setting. Um, you know, I'm, you know, I try to get away from the students once in a while, but you know, basically I'm on 24 seven for three and a half weeks. It allows for a different kind of a relationship to build and allows for, you know, all kinds of moments when we're not sitting around doing, you know, academic work in a circle. It's not, not exactly a classroom, but, you know, a classroom-like there. But times when, you know, it might be in the, in the van traveling or at a restaurant, you know, over supper that, you know, students are still processing things we're seeing in Guatemala. Um, I get to talk, 
I often have chances to tell my own personal story of serving in Central America um, in ways that students say, oh, you really can't do this, you know. So I kind of know how to do it other places, but then that's the, that's the irony here. Do I, too, also need to go somewhere else to educate well? Well, I'm still, even if that's, even if that's the answer, you know, and so, and I'm a big believer in service learning, in international education, and so on. But I'm still going to spend most of my time as an educator in a classroom. So I mean that quite literally. Um, so even if, even if, you know, for everything you say about nature, the same problem as my international education comes up. Can't spend all your time in nature if you're an educator. So. When I was an undergraduate here a few centuries ago, um, I honestly think the most, I think the best practice that I experienced was the monk showing up in the black robe every day in my class. I took as many classes with monks as I could, whether it was Godfrey or Dietrich or Ray Pedrosetti or Albrecht or Ivan. Uh, or, or any of those that I've forgotten, um, it communicated volumes. It really did. Um, and beyond that, I'm, I'm mostly stymied, except I think that Bill's question prompted a thought from me uh, out of my project where I'm working on Catholic social teaching. And of course, the, the theme of the common good and pursuing the common good not only uh, amongst Christians, but in cooperation with others with the assumption that the ultimate common good that the gospel points us toward uh, needs to have historical incarnations in ways. So it's, it's a matter, you know, best practices, what are we talking about? I need to assume a capacity for humanity somewhere in my students. You know, whatever's happening in the culture that is fighting against that and that they are maybe cooperating with more than I wish they would, I still need to try to reach mm -hmm. and engage and, and marvel at mm -hmm. their capacity for humanity. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the list of Benedictine values. Uh, Father Hillary gave us about 10 lists <laughs> from different Benedictine colleges and high schools. Some of them had only three values. Some of them had 15 values. And even the ones you see at St. John's are different from each other. Oh. So there, it's, a dynamic, it's a dynamic list. One of our lists was created by alumni interested in the question. Another list was more done more in, internally. Um, it'd be interesting for each of you to read through the rules slowly and write out your own list for your particular life and for the relationships that you're in, the family, family situation and, and such. As a matter of fact, the chapter seven in the rule <coughs> is on humility. It's by far the biggest chapter in the rule. So it is, a, it is, is quite a, um, uh, quite conspicuously absent from, from our particular list. Probably it's because the, we want to lure people here before we teach them the tough stuff. <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> and there is a kind of a drift in colleges to be more a bit more appealing all the time. And the costs are going up and up and up because of um, stadium facilities and all these other things that aren't absolutely essential, but to get kids here so that you can have four years with them to teach them about frugality and simplicity <laughs> and, and those kinds of things. So and I appreciate your thoughts very much. Gerald, I want to thank you very much for saying many of the things that I wish I had thought of along the way. And Father Mark has just set the stage for what I was going to ask about. I'm going to offer you an opportunity. 
Here's the background. In nearly, very nearly, 60 years of monastic life and 44 years of teaching in the university, I would suppose that three-fourths of that, at least, never had the support and benefit of a thing called a list of the Benedictine values. Mm -hmm. That was a creation here about 10 or 15 years ago that came upon most of us without having known it was being created, <laughs> or why. And then suddenly it showed up on a, on a holy card or a poster, something like the Ten Commandments must have happened one time. Out of, you know, out of, out of three or four hundred years of teaching the people of God, suddenly a list shows up. And um, I suppose it didn't take too long for people to realize it wasn't exactly a taxative list. You've only been here one semester and you spotted it already. Even, <laughs> even the central value wasn't there. So, if you were going to approach a talk differently, I like the one you gave, <laughs> uh, but if you weren't trying to match your stuff, your essay, with the Benedictine values on the holy card, what values might you list coming out of your own essays and reflections that could help us to recognize our own Benedictine values and teaching opportunities better? You might just come up with some things that are very helpful for us, looking at it from a, another point of view. There's other ways to ask the question, but I'll, mm -hmm. I'll keep it really short there. <laughs> well, I mean, I've, I've put a lot of uh, time and ink into reflecting on stability as something which may be uniquely Benedictine even among religious orders, but nonetheless <coughs> speaks to what I think the rest of us Christians, if, to say nothing of larger society, need, and that is the capacity to stay in relationship even when it's hard. So. Gerald, uh, I was very excited for your talk <clears throat> um, as one of your ethics colleagues. Um, I just, I wish everyone in theology here were here for this because you prompted lots of ideas. And um, one idea that I have, because I seek to get at the joyous authenticity as well, uh, what I think what grounds my approach is that is the deep belief that in Catholic natural law that all students that I'm looking at in the classroom do have an unwritten law of fulfillment and goodness and truth in their hearts. Mm -hmm. And through the academic enterprise of ethics and asking the right questions, we can go deep and get them to articulate what is you know, superficially what they want, but it doesn't fulfill them in any deep sense, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I just wondered if you've used the Catholic natural law theory in your classes and if you found that it works. Um, and then I also wondered if you are a very humble person, uh, but I'd like to press you on in the moments in your academic classroom experiences when have you had that exciting moment where you do feel like they're, that, that something's happening in the classroom and that they are reaching for that more, that joyfulness, that authenticity? So, you know, if you can share any, any of your experiences to help me. And I also want to thank you because as I listened to you, I had one idea of of starting my classes very early in the semester with asking the students to write about which of the Benedictine values that you put up um, excite them, attract their interest, why they think those values would lead to a fulfilling life, and then which values do they find boring and unattractive. And then return to that as we proceed. You know, I mean, I'm guessing moderation, they're gonna think that's very dull or stability, it, I don't know. But I think some will, you know what I mean? And then just to kind of go along. So um, you just prompted a lot, so thank you. 
Um, I use, well, a textbook that I've used in my sort of basic introduction to Christian ethics class that you may know, uh, Paul Waddell's Happiness and the Moral Life, is that it? Something like that, which is very much the natural law uh, tradition. Uh, you know, it's, it's complicated a little for me kind of being a Mennonite Catholic in which, you know, in the Mennonite tradition there's much more, there's suspicion of the natural law tradition because appeals to nature have often, you know, justified violence, uh, you know, in the name of, well, self-defense is natural, you know, and so on. Um, so, in my mind, I haven't written on this, but in my mind, I think we need to talk about the, the, crucif the cruciform natural law that carries with it the, that, the sense that, you know, in the deepest, if Jesus Christ is revealed, the deepest reality of what it means to be human beings, you know, he's done that by bearing a cross. And so he's, so we need to read natural law through the cross to see things in our nature, in our human nature that we wouldn't have seen without Christ. Um, so that's a quick little bit of shop talk here among us Christian ethicists. Um, but yeah, I mean, you've got to, got to start out talking about, you know, what really brings happiness. Um, I view there's a, from 10 years ago there or so, there was a article in New York Times Magazine that I still use that is sort of surveying the new kind of, what is it, the psychology of happiness, psychologists that are talking about, you know, well, let, we spent all our time talking about how to help people when they've got something wrong with them. How do we, shouldn't we give more time to what it takes to be happy? For, and there's way, and so that's an entirely secular article, but there's things as then we unpack it in the classroom. I mean, I could get it for you if, I don't remember the name exactly right now, but. Um, so I do those kind of things, sure. Um, experiences, I'm humble and I haven't talked about my experiences of success in the classroom. Maybe my humility gets in the way. I don't like to talk about myself and my own life, but yes, I have. Probably it's the times when, and here's where, again, I have more occasions to do this when I'm in Guatemala with students talking about the church in Latin America, talking about uh, Christian approaches, Christian responses to poverty and injustice and so on. Um, but also sometimes, so I get chances to talk about my own life and experience in ways that don't always come up in the ordinary classroom. But even in the ordinary classroom, yeah, I had a quick allusion there to Parker Palmer, The Courage to Teach, where, I mean, that's, don't be afraid to talk about your own life and, um, you know, your deepest passions and, and so on. So I, not, no one experience is coming to mind, but I associate your question with his answer, so. I'd like to invite other questions to stay after and uh, approach them like that. Otherwise, let's give him a big round.